All right, uh, show of hands. Um, I was given the opportunity to potentially make this slot a nap. Everyone's in favor. Spike, uh, can't do it? Okay, gotta give the talk, I'm sorry. I tried, I really did. Cool, hi, I'm John Sullivan, or sometimes John Sully, because my uh, internet pseudonym creativity is really good. Um, I've been doing Ruby and Rails for going on seven years now, and I am a turbo enthusiast. Before we jump in, I also want to give a big thanks to the whole team. If you could give a round of applause, that would be awesome. Thank you guys for putting this on and all the volunteers. It's been really awesome. Um, I have a background sort of in audio and lights, so thank you to you guys back there. You guys are great. The sound system is so good. Cool. Well, there have been some great talks today, right? Really good content, really happy about it. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about Turbo Frames Explored for fun and profit. And I really want to go back to start. I'm going to do the thing that, I don't know, I'm going to put a Twitter tweet up from back when it was called Twitter, and new magic was released. This was in 2020. Uh, I think a lot of us probably remember this. Big fanfare, but whether or not it's been picked up by everyone has been kind of hit and miss just because it's a totally new framework. It's a totally new system. Um, let, me, let me do an interactive exercise here. Could you raise your hand if you like writing JavaScript? It's OK. It's all right. No one's going to bite. I like writing JavaScript. Could you raise your hand if you like writing Ruby? Yeah, it's a conference. It's cool. Uh, keep it up if you prefer writing JavaScript to Ruby. And it's also OK. No, it's all right. I appreciate your honesty. And then just keep it up if you also love writing Webpack configs. <laughs> I know. I know. So this was the sort of idea that I feel like was presented so much with the new magic and a lot of the Turbo stuff is sort of the down with JavaScript, we have a new way platform. And I think that that uh, adversarial approach is maybe the reason why it hasn't had the, the full uptake that everyone wants. And I'm here to give you a different message. It's not against JavaScript. I like JavaScript. JavaScript's fun. But that portrayal doesn't capture why Hotwire is actually so great. And the reason is because you just write way less code. There's nothing wrong with JavaScript, but like two lines of Ruby is way easier to manage than 300 lines of JavaScript. So I want to go back to where we started. When Hotwire was released, we got several new pieces. You have your Rails app backend, and then we have this new Hotwire thing, and it itself is three big pieces. There's the Turbo Stack, Stimulus, and Strata. And so when we dive in, we have Stimulus, which got rewritten because the Basecamp devs wanted us all to have to rewrite our controllers. Um, thanks, guys. We have Strata, which just came out like finally a couple weeks ago. Um, I haven't touched it at all, but it seems really cool for native app stuff, iOS and Android. And then we have Turbo, which itself is also three pieces. There's Turbo Drive, Turbo Frames, and Turbo Streams. Today we're going to be talking about Turbo Frames specifically. Um, and I want to go into the three pieces of Turbo Frames that I think I want to show off. I think they're really cool. I think you guys would really use them. And I want to talk about them. So Turbo Frames can do cool things. But more importantly, Turbo Frames can do cool things built faster with less code and less thought on front end development. Now, I'm not going to get into every single implementation detail here. That's not the point of this talk. But I want to show you some neat stuff that is pretty easy to implement if you want to dig into it. This is all stuff we're running in production at my company, Agent Pronto. I work there with my team. We're all here. There's three of us, real small group. But We've been running it for a couple years, and it's been really awesome for us. We've been able to maintain it with almost no thought, which is really exciting. So let me go back a little bit. We're talking about Turbo Frames, which is sort of the middle layer, but it's a little bit hard to reason about Turbo Frames unless you understand what Turbo Drive does. And for those of us that have been in the community for a while, we had Turbo Links, which got deprecated for Turbo Frames because new names are cool. But now it's Turbo Drive. And Turbo Drive is essentially a default glue that you just turn on, and it allows you to change pages seamlessly without reloading the entire browser. Now, when I think about that resourcefully, what I like to think about it as is I'm changing which resource I'm looking at. So if we go to like the classic library books, authors kind of demo, we go from one book to another. We're looking at one book, we switch to another one. Turbo Drive just handles that really seamlessly. I'm going to give you an example of that in practice. Oh, this is a live coding talk. Thank you. Um, like I said, I work for Agent Pronto. What we're going to be looking at is Agent Pronto's um, web interface and mostly running locally because that seems safer. And 
where we use TurboDrive is on our public website. So I'm going to be switching between two different pages that kind of explain what Agent Pronto is. Well, what is Agent Pronto, John? Agent Pronto is a service where if you're looking for a realtor, we help you find a good realtor. It's pretty much that simple. But like everyone, we have a very nice website to help explain that to you. So we have two pages here, how it works and about us. And as you'll notice as I click through them is the browser isn't doing full page loads between these. Safari would show a red loading bar here. It would have to repaint everything. That's not happening. Instead, we're seeing this really, really quick single page app-like transition between these pages. And I think we can see that on the server on the side, it's still loading these full pages from the server. In fact, as far as Rails knows, that's a totally normal browser client loading the full page. So Turbo Drive just gives us that seamless swap between resources with pretty much nothing required. In fact, so little required that the code is very literally just import hotwired Turbo Rails. Now, Matthew mentioned this earlier, but it is one of those systems where the default is take over the entire browser state, just do the thing automatically. And for a lot of reasons, that's convenient. Not always, but usually. So in a little more context, let's take an example layout. It's got a couple tags, some body stuff. And inside that JavaScript pack tag, all we have is that import. So there's no hidden wires or anything. It, it is that easy. We have a couple stimulus things there below, but it's pretty much that simple. So if we go from there, I want to go up a layer. Let's talk about Turbo Frames finally. So if Turbo Drive is switching between resources, what you're looking at, one book to another, I like to think of Turbo Frames more as interacting with a sub resource or paginating. So in the case of books, maybe, maybe you're looking at a book page, but you have several authors, or you're switching between authors on the book page. That's a really good case to use a turbo frame. It's a sub-resource when you're still looking at one resource page. Pagination is also a really useful case for that, and that's an example I'm going to show you here as well. So this would be our testimonials page. Uh, it's a little different in production, but I've shortened it up for this conference. It's pretty basic. Hey, our Site is great, use us. And here we have a list of different testimonials. And the nice part is, as I click through these, they just pop right in. The browser isn't changing at all. I'm not reloading whole pages. In fact, my URL and the um, address bar isn't changing either. Now again, we can still see that the browser is serving these things. But I'm, I'm not getting a, a full page experience. I'm getting a single page app experience. Well, that's really cool. How do we get there? How about two lines of Ruby? Now you have full pagination on your whatever testimonials for us. All it is is a, a turbo frame tag start and end. So maybe the second one is not even fully counting. But it's two lines. And that's really accessible. I don't have to write any JavaScript for pagination stuff. Now again, I'm not saying that writing that stuff is bad. I'm just saying that this is easier. And I'm lazy. So it's great. So I want to explain how this works a little bit. And I'm going to start at the high level. I want to walk through sort of the basics of how turbo frames work. And then we're going to build up from there. And we're going to See some cool examples. Like I said, this is a diagramming tool. It's great for diagrams. If you'll indulge me a little bit, we're going to walk through an HTTP response in Rails. Um, assuming a request already came in, this is kind of how the response is built up. And usually, I know, it starts with the controller and then does the stuff. But we're just going to say that it goes from the database, goes up through a model, then we go up through a controller, we render a view, and it goes to the client. But this view has a little turbo frame tag in it. There's nothing really special here. It's just an HTML tag. And then ultimately, it renders in the client's browser. And it has the frame in the, in the DOM at that point. So what's going on is when you click something inside of that frame, a link, Turbo, on the, back, uh, um, on the front end still, but in the background, in memory, Turbo goes and requests that page from the, the back end server. Now, the back end server treats this just like any other uh, request. It renders some view. It sends it over the wire. It's just happening in Turbo's internal front end code and not in the browser. And then Turbo, its entire job is to find the matching frame in the new response and replace that frame from the original DOM with the new code. It doesn't touch anything outside of that. Everything else outside of that stays the same. That's its entire job. So the frame gets updated with the new content, but the address bar didn't change at all. It's the same page. You're still looking at the same resource. It's just something within that page changing. 
Well, the other nice part here is that the back end didn't have to do anything special. It didn't even know about it. It handled both requests the same, and it didn't even know about any client frame state. It just rendered two different uh, paths with different requests. So for Rails, this is very simple. We didn't have to change anything. And then Turbo handles the replacement for us. Now, there's a big emoji there because there's an asterisk. Turbo throws away the rest of the markup. So we get a full page response, but it threw away everything else because the only thing it injected, the only thing it took was the frame. That's a little wasteful, but the nice part is that when you run Turbo Rails, it skips rendering some of the things in that response because it knows it's coming from a frame. So you're still wasting a little bit, but it's not too much. It skips rendering a lot of the stuff because it knows that the intention is for the frame content to get replaced and nothing else. Two lines, that's pretty nice. So let's go back to this testimonials example. I wanna walk through it a little bit deeper now that we have some framework of understanding. We have our testimonials page, and I wanna overlay a little bit of highlighting for what's what. Above and below that box, we have just normal markup. There's nothing special about it, but that box itself is actually a turbo frame wrapped piece of markup. And so when I click that two, three, whatever page, we're initiating a uh, we're, we're clicking a link from within the frame, which tells Turbo to go do the whole background, pull the thing, swap the frame out stuff. And that's what it does. So behind the scenes, it actually grabs that page. And if you look at the path on that page, it looks like any normal Rails path. It's a query string with page two. And if you were to go request that page manually in the browser, it would load the same stuff. It would load the whole same page with the second page of testimonials there for you. But because it happened inside of a Turbo frame, what's really happening is that Turbo went and grabbed that page in memory, and then it swaps in only the new frame content. It leaves everything else untouched, which means we actually have the original untouched markup on the top and bottom, but the middle content where the frame is was totally replaced with the new stuff. Meanwhile, our browser didn't change navigation. So we have that single page app experience where things just swap right in without any scrolling or, or crazy behavior, it just goes right in. Now that's distinctly different from Turbo Drive because if we didn't have a frame here, if we just let Turbo Drive do its job and swap the entire page, you would have a reset of scroll most likely. I mean, you could fix it, but you would also have a browser page, uh, a navigation bar change. It's just a little bit more heavy handed. Turbo Frames gives us the ability to, excuse me, to have content inside of a page change while the overall page doesn't. We're looking at the same resource. And then from the back end, as I mentioned, Pretty standard render stuff. Get testimonials versus get testimonials page two. It doesn't really know anything different, which is pretty nice. So, turbo frames. When navigating from within a frame, replace the content of this frame with the content of the same named frame in the response. That is how turbo frames works. That's pretty much it. Or put by Patrick, take the thing over there and shove it over there. Turbo frames. I appreciate that after lunch light laughter, thank you. <laughs> All right, I wanna get into some of, the, some of the meat of this talk and it's the cool things that turbo frames can do. So this is sort of the foundational understanding of how turbo frames works. Take some stuff, put it in where it was, ignore the rest of the request. But we can get pretty clever with turbo frames, and there's a few examples I wanna walk through. The first one is turbo frames for lazy loading, the first of the cool things with less code. It's unfortunately a little bit more complex than that. Turbo frames calls lazy loading either eager lazy loading or lazy lazy loading, which is very clear. The difference is careful. So eager lazy loading means that you have a frame on your page that loads initially with stock unloaded content. And as soon as the page is rendered, then it pulls that content immediately once the page is done rendering. Lazy, lazy loaded is when the frame is loaded after the page is loaded and not until you scroll it into the viewport. So this loosely mimics what's available, I believe in iframes and images right now with the native browser lazy options. Uh, and I think that was the goal, but they're, they're a little different and they're a little distinct. So let's talk about eager lazy loading first. The good news is that adding it to a frame is really easy. You have some frame, uh, you add a source attribute, and then whatever's inside the frame initially is what you see at first, and the source is what gets loaded. It, it pulls that path as soon as the page loads. This is another thing that's easier to see in practice. 
with cats. Cats. Wow. So, this is our homepage. <laughs> Not as it is on production. And what we have here is, I'm gonna keep reloading the page for the sake of the example and cute cats. When you load the page, you can see the page finishes loading and it's done, and then it goes and requests that frame. You can, also, you can also see the default content is, please wait for cat. And then once the cat loads, it slots into that spot. So this is pretty canonical lazy loading, but all we had to do to achieve that lazy loading is wrap our content in a turbo frame. We didn't have to do anything special on the front end. I knew this would work. Cats. Now, if we want to talk about lazy, lazy loading, this is a little bit different. So the frame is lazily loaded, but it's actually going to wait all the way until you scroll the content into the viewport of the browser. Also quite easy to add, same thing, you need a source attribute that tells Turbo where to load that frame from, some path, and then you just add loading lazy to it, and that will tell it to wait until it's in the viewport to load the content. Let's look at more cats. That seemed to work. So up here at the top of the page, I have this eager lazy loading thing. But lower down on the page, I have a second cat. And it's not until I scroll into that page, uh, sorry, scroll it into the viewport that it starts to load it. Bless you. So we can see that over here on the server log. Another request will pop up as soon as it's, there it is, in the viewport. But most importantly, when I first load the page, that request doesn't pop up because it's not loading it until it's in the viewport. So we have two different options for lazy loading with turbo frames, and they're pretty easy to install. It's a couple attributes on a turbo frame, and that's pretty much it. Eager and lazy, both lazy. It's great. But it actually is more powerful than that. See, these are images, and you can lazy load images right now. Natively in a browser, we already have this. What's really cool about turbo frames is that anything you wrap, anything you can wrap in a turbo frame, you can lazy load. I'm gonna show you an example of that as well. In this example, same home page because it already had a frame on it, it was easy. But here we have some other endpoint that takes a while to load. And it's not an image, it's some other content. In this case, it's 300 digits of pi. And it takes a while to compute that. So we have the full power of lazy loading that we get for images and iframes and things, but we can do it for any content. Anything that you can possibly mark up can go in there. Maybe that's a chart that takes a lot of horsepower to render. Maybe that's a database query that you should probably optimize, but this will work really well for in the short term. Don't tell anyone. It doesn't matter. It'll work. Cool. All right, the second thing I want to talk about is turbo frames for job pingers. And this is something, I, I, I don't think it's a real name. I call them job pingers. It's a pretty common pattern where we have some kind of user that posts some stuff, and then we run a job, and we wait for that job to complete. And we have to like show them something along the way because we don't want to hold up our web server, but we want to show them a loading bar, and while that bar is loading, it's pinging the back end, hey, is the job done, hey, is the job done, hey, is the job done. And usually that takes at least some JavaScript to get the front end part to keep pinging the back end and find out the job is done. This is a terrible idea that I had that is still in R&D, so I don't have a demo for you, but it's like lazy loading, but on repeat. So you have like a source, right? And that'll cause it to lazy load. But what if the source is the same path you just loaded? So when you get the frame, it loads another frame immediately. That's the lazy loading part. But then the frame that comes back has the same path as a source. So it loads it again. And then the frame that comes back has the same path as a source. So it loads it again. And so we end up with this circular keep loading the same frame over and over and over until the job is done. Isn't that what a job pinger does? It just keeps querying until the job is done? Yeah. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> so again, still in R&D, but it's like lazy loading on repeat. The idea would basically be that you have a turbo frame with the same path, and if the job is finished, then you render the cool stuff, but if it's not, you just render keep waiting for job or, or whatever you want to show in that meantime, and as long as that path is still the same, it'll keep pinging itself. The reason it's still in R&D is because Turbo doesn't currently have a way of uh, oh, uh, slowing that down. I'll let you figure out the rest. All right, number three. This gets pretty cool. Turbo frames for modals, another thing that traditionally requires quite a bit of JavaScript and something we've really enjoyed running in production because it makes our lives so much easier. 
I have a demo for this one as well. So with Agent Pronto, when you want a realtor, you get hooked up with us and then we connect you to some realtors and that works out really well usually. And so we give you this dashboard where you can see all the realtors we've matched you with. Uh, example Realtor is a really good one. When you click View Profile, it comes up as a modal, but there's no JavaScript here. It just popped up, it looks nice, and then we can close it and repeat, and it's just this modal interaction that traditionally would require JavaScript, and we're not running any, which is unique. We have easy back-end driven modals. So how does this work? Well, what happens is, what we actually have running is on every page in our layout, we have an empty hidden turbo frame at the bottom of the markup. In practice, it actually is very literally a turbo frame tag called modal that's just empty. But the fact that it's there is really powerful. See, hidden and empty turbo frame tags can themselves be quite powerful if you're willing or open to filling them up later throughout the life cycle of your user's session. As you control what's in there and what's not over time, you get some really cool effects. So in this case, when the person clicks view profile, well, the link is basically behaving as if it is in the, in the frame, even though it's not, and that's what the data turbo frame modal does. So if we think about it like they clicked a link inside the frame, well, Turbo's gonna go request that thing, find the same content, and throw it in, right? And that's exactly what we want to have happen, because in that request, we actually respond with a new response that now has content inside of the frame. In this case, it's our background for fixed CSS stuff, and then we render the agent profile. And what that means is, when Turbo matches that and throws it in the existing page, the CSS causes it to sit in front, but it's all the rendered content as a modal without anything on the front end happening. This is all just back end code that we wrote in our layout. On top of that, when you close it, that's actually a request too. You don't need any JavaScript for that. See, if you make another request, and it's probably to the same background, uh, the initial page, as long as that next request contains nothing in the turbo frame, but the frame is still there, well now you've effectively closed the modal because everything that was in that modal space just disappeared, which is closing a modal, it's gone now. And now you're back to the original content underneath which was never changed, never moved, never messed with, it's the original content from the first request. There's a unique power to an empty turbo frame. The fact that it's there means it's addressable and that any subsequent request that has content within it will match it and fill it up. But if anything that you work with it doesn't fill it up, it's still there. So understanding how to use empty and non-empty frames is itself a very powerful concept. So we get modals with very minimal backend code. Now, what we do is we wrap that in a helper. It makes it really easy to work with. I'm not gonna demo that today, but I'll be happy to share some slides in the future and show you how that works. Um, but it basically just means that we can call, hey, do this in a frame and render something, uh, sorry, do this in a modal and render something from anywhere in our views, and we know that the next request is gonna render that in a modal, regardless of where the user is in their workflow. Because it's always in the layout, we have an empty frame available to get hydrated. All right, the fourth example I have for you is wizards, which I don't call wizards, but I like emojis. So this is what I would call multi-step forms, and we're probably all pretty familiar with this. These are in a lot of apps. You walk a user through multiple steps of a form rather than one big form, and at the end they hit post or submit, and everything goes in and everyone's happy. So I'm gonna show you this in practice with a couple of different things here. First, this is our production homepage, um, and this is our form when you are looking for an agent. As you walk through it, you hit on buying, you say you're in Boulder, and you walk through the steps. What are you looking for? Well, a single family house, and then yada, yada. It's a fairly, tr fairly traditional form. You walk through the steps, we get to the end, we submit it, it's all fine. Here on my local environment, I've changed a little bit. So instead, when I hit on buying, I actually stay on the home page, and it seamlessly transitions and pulls the form in. And now we're staying on the page, but the form, the turbo frame is propagating this form step over step, and it continues to just keep replacing the content as I keep getting back new frames in the responses. Well, that's nifty, but an even cooler part of this is that if you noticed in our production environment, the layout we're using inside of the form wizard is different. This isn't our homepage layout, obviously. It's, it's pretty simple, but it's a very different layout. Well, over here, we're still in the same layout, but I've set up turbo frames to actually, uh, I think it was push, Brooke, you were talking about HTMX, 
and how it pushes the URL. So Turbo Frames can do that too. And so as I step through these steps, my address bar URL is actually changing along with the page. As I hit single family, it switches up here to price. As I continue, it goes to other stuff. And the neat thing that this gives you is that you're pulling frames from a different layout track of your application, and if you refresh the page, or if the user does something that causes them to refresh the page, it pushed them over to your traditional track because it was progressing the URL along the way. That's confusing, so let's talk about it. When we first start, we load the home page, and we have some simple static markup around the frame, and then we have this wizard frame boundary, and we click a button. So, as we mentioned before, Turbo goes and grabs that uh, new path, and I'm showing that in the box because it's just happening in memory here. But what you'll see is the layout difference. So Turbo goes and grabs that new path. And traditionally, if you were hitting that page, as it is in our production environment, you would see it in the new layout, but it would still find the matching corresponding frame. So because it's doing it from a Turbo frame request, it's going to inject that directly onto the existing page, which was first rendered with the home page layout. And it just throws it right on there. Now, this is a cool paradigm because it means we can pull frames from somewhere else that has a totally different layout and use it on our existing layout and our existing page. We're not constrained to the layout of where we're pulling from or the layout of where we're injecting into. And like I said, it does push along the URL address bar value path. So that is just turbo frame, sorry, data turbo action advance. And that'll make every new frame pull actually progress the history of the browser and change your path. And in doing that, if you refresh the full path, instead of Turbo going and grabbing just a chunk of the page on that path, the matching frame, if you refresh your browser, well, now you're loading the full path and you get that new full environment for that layout. Cool. I wrote a really long guide on this. Um, if you're interested, you're more than welcome to check it out. It's nine parts, it's a little verbose. I was a younger guy then. Anyway, the full code breakdowns are there. Uh, the full guide is there as well. No comment. All right, those are the four examples I wanted to show you. And I think it holds up to the thesis. Turbo frames can do cool things. Can typically do it faster. You generally are going to do it with way less code than you would with JavaScript. And more or less, you're going to have less thought on front end stuff. It's a different kind of thought. You have to think slightly differently about how you're actually moving content around your user's page. But in general, it should be less. And that's the goal, anyway. Like I said, we're not here to hate JavaScript. We're just here to write less code. So, Turbo Frames can do pagination and sub resource interactions. It can do lazy loading in eager and lazy ways. It can do job status pinging and callbacks. It can com do complete modal interactions without much code at all. It can do wizards, multi-step forms, and more. And so finally, I want to give you kind of a framework of how I think about Hotwire, because I think it helps to have some organization around this stuff. Hotwire has a lot of parts, and it's a little bit hard to keep straight, because there's drive, there's frames, and there's streams, and there are places where they can overlap. So when I think about Turbo Drive, like I said, it's navigating seamlessly between different resources, and it's the easy first step. If you're just slapping it on an existing Rails app, it's probably going to work decently, depending on how your JavaScript currently exists. But moving between resources, it's very simple to work with. Turbo Frames is more about within a UI. If you're looking at different sub-resources, it's really good for that. Any kind of in-page interactions, any kind of asynchronous loading, um, even some of the stuff that we heard this morning about caching can be done really well with Turbo Frames because you just load it in an asynchronous frame, and that's not caching itself, but it'll load after the main page, which means you could cache the main page more. And finally, you have Turbo Streams, which I didn't talk about, but is more built around real-time user interactions uh, and or si system-driven page updates, something like uh, someone posts a comment and it immediately pops up on someone else's browser. And then finally, we have Stimulus, which I really do enjoy the metaphor of being lightly sprinkled on top, but most nicely, it works really well with Turbo. As you load new frames, it automatically connects to Stimulus. Whoop. There we go. All right, I wanted to give a thank you to Agent Pronto, my employer. 
Our team is here, so three of us. We're sitting over there. Feel free to come say hi. If you need a realtor, check us out. Uh, we do run Hotwire, Turbo, and Rails 7 all right now in production. Uh, some would say in the wild. That's my joke for the day. It's a really good one. This has been Turbo Frames Explored for Fun and Profit. My name is John Sullivan or Sully, depending on my creativity for the day. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. And if any of these emojis interest you, I love all of them. Please come talk to me. Thank you so much. I would love to take questions if anyone has some. Yes, up front. No, I haven't. The question was, have you ever made an infinite scroll with the lazy loaded turbo frames? That's a really good idea. I like that a lot. I'm gonna play with that. No, I have not made it. Very interested. It works really well. It works really well. That's awesome. I'm assuming it requires less JavaScript. Sweet. All right, in the back. Can turbo frame added content contain new turbo frames? Can you recursively turbo frame yourself to oblivion with thousands of new frames calling thousands of new frames? Yes, I believe you can. I do believe you can. And at that point, it's just the turbo package on the front end being aware that a new frame is loaded and, and handling it appropriately. I believe it does work fine. Any other questions? Sure, okay, I'm gonna summarize the question. Have you created any kind of self-contained view component that is itself a turbo frame that supports high-level JS APIs like drag and drop? Uh, no, also sounds interesting, haven't done it. Our use case has been fairly chill so far. Um, don't get any ideas. <laughs> sure, any, have there been any use cases that have not been a good fit for turbo frames? I think the answer that I would give you is there are lots of use cases that are not a good fit for turbo frames. I don't think that there are that many use cases that are not a good fit for one of the pieces of the turbo stack. Certainly there are extremely JavaScript-y things that are you know, native Canvas type stuff. You're not gonna build Figma on turbo. I would not recommend it. But for most of the stuff that we've done, uh, and for most apps that tend to be CRUD plus, I think it works really well. I think it would be challenging to find something that really can't work with turbo or doesn't work with turbo unless you need very, very intense uh, front-end environments or APIs. Stimulus itself is a really nice tool. Yeah, it's a really good question. The question was, if you refresh in a multi-step form somewhere in the middle, uh, was the data already saved somewhere, or what happens with that? And the answer is, you have multiple choices in how you want to do it, but you do have to save it somewhere. So regardless of whether you're using Turbo at all, or you're just running a multi-step form, you have to save that state somewhere. Sometimes it can be in the user session, maybe you're using the cache on the back end, maybe you're saving it in the database and you're building up an object along the steps, and it's just not fully validated until the end. Uh, my guides cover that pretty well. I would give those a read if you're curious about it, uh, but you do have options. Turbo isn't itself saving that for you. It doesn't do the state management for that kind of multi-step form magic. It's just sort of the visual layer on top. Yeah, it's a good question. The question was, turbo frames obviously can control and interact with your browser history or not based on your choice. Um, are there times where that's a good idea, a bad idea, or introduces bugs? And the answer is, Turbo frames can interact with your browser history in a very deliberate choice, and you have to make that choice. In most cases, especially if you're doing something where you're looking at a resource and you're using frames to interact with a sub-resource, I would not change the browser history in those cases. If you're doing pagination stuff, I would not change the browser history in those cases. I think the default is the best answer, which is don't change the browser history in those cases. It's really only when you have a page where the real canonical content of that page is inside the frame, such as with our multi-step form, where you should think about, okay, maybe we do wanna override the browser state. That way, if they refresh or come back to the page, it loads correctly. But given that most frame usage, in my experience, hasn't been that real canonical piece of the page, I wouldn't recommend changing the browser history ad hoc. Yeah, yeah, actually we have. Um, not with Microsoft Clarity, but we've had, we had a little bit of a, a scuffle with even just Google Analytics and how it has to be aware of the fact that, and this is a Turbo Drive concern, not a frame concern. Turbo Drive turns your app technically into a single page app. It's not reloading the entire page. So you don't have the traditional uh, JavaScript events as that page loads. Now you just have Turbo events that can signal, hey, I loaded the new page because the native browser APIs aren't triggering anything. Um, the thing that we found for that is that Turbo exposes a lot of these events. So you can hook into, I think it's page loaded, uh, Turbo page loaded or something like that. and just communicate with that API. So basically in those moments, you tell Google Analytics or Microsoft Clarity, hey, we loaded a new page. 
And most of these frameworks tend to support that kind of message back as reset. A lot of them call it SPA mode, single page app mode, um, or JavaScript mode. They have different names. But that tends to be the best way to work around it. We've had issues with legacy JavaScript as well. We have some view code on several pages. And the best answer is, in that event for the turbo page load, we have to just reinitialize the entire view stack, uh, view, V-U-E view. Um, and it's a little heavy handed, but when you're transitioning from an existing app to turbo, sometimes you just have to have those steps in the middle where you have to tell your, jo your existing JavaScript to reinitialize its entire self because it isn't aware of turbo. But luckily we have the hooks for that. Specifically with regards to turbo, uh, I mean, okay, so the question was how stable is the stack and or how many Rails upgrades have you been through with this? Uh, the answer is that it's gotten fairly stable, I think, within the last year. Um, but we have to remember that this stuff just came out in the end of 2020, really the beginning of 21. So that first, I think, year and a half of all the Turbo stuff, it's been pretty unstable. Um, there was a lot of stuff around Turbo frames in particular and how it responds or what it does when you get a response back that is like an um, unprocessable entity, some kind of 400 or a form error. Um, that stuff has changed quite a bit. But I think we're at a point where it's getting pretty stable. So you had a second question? Oh, it's a really good question. Yeah. The good news is that it depends. See, a turbo frame is pulling content from somewhere with a matching turbo frame, right? Well, that means that you ostensibly have to have a controller somewhere that is serving that content with the matching turbo frame. That controller doesn't realize that it's being called from turbo from some client. It's just serving a response to a request, which means for feature testing, you just write a feature on one uh, a controller, feature, system spec, whichever you prefer. Oh, yeah. Big fan. It's ongoing, though, I tell you. Um, yeah, we have. We, we've tried to convert as much as we can to, I am still here. Thank you. Prove it. Uh, we've tried to convert as much of our, our view code as we can to stimulus. Stimulus works so well with turbo stuff and just automatically connecting uh, to controllers and frames and all that stuff. It's really a joy to work with. Is there a strategy for converting like heavier handed SPA JavaScript to stimulus? I don't think I could prescribe one. You really just have to take the time to fully understand each React component or view element or whatever you're working on. And the better question is not straight up, how do I convert it to stimulus? It's how can we make this a backend asset that's served that's using frames where needed if we can? Not everything has to be front end. So if you can make it just a piece of your response from the back end, you save yourself a lot of trouble with stimulus conversion later on because there's nothing to convert. Anybody else? Thank you so much.